Good evening, everyone. My name is James Lin. I'm an assistant professor of Taiwan Studies and International Studies here at the University of Washington. Welcome to our uh, book talk series. Uh, this evening, we have the honor of having Professor Ling Weiping, uh, who will be giving her book talk on her recently published book, Island Fantasia. Uh, so let me give a quick introduction to Professor Lin before we get started. Uh, Professor Ling Weiping is Professor of Anthropology at National Taiwan University. She received her PhD in Anthropology from Cambridge University. Her interests include religion, kinship, and imagination. And she's the author of Materializing Magic Power, Chinese Popular Religion in Villages and Cities, which was published by Harvard University Asia Center in 2015. And today she'll be presenting from her most recent book, Island Fantasia, Imagining Subjects on the Military Frontline Between China and Taiwan, which was published by Cambridge University Press last year, 2021. Uh, I should also mention that we are very fortunate because uh, Professor Lin's book is available open access, which means that you can access her book and read it for free at the Cambridge University Press website. Uh, so please do take advantage of that. Um, and uh, without further ado, I think I will hand it over to Professor Lin. Right, okay. Um, my name is Wei Ping Ling. I'm an anthropologist uh, working in National Taiwan University. Thank you, James, for inviting me. It's my great honor to speak to you today. Uh, okay. Island Fantasia is the first book of the new Taiwan study series by Cambridge University Press. It discusses the Matu Islands, forlorn and isolated outpost of southeast China, which were certainly transformed into a military front line in 1949 by the Cold War and the communist nationalist conflict. The nationalist army occupied the islands, commencing more than 40 long years of military rule. With the lifting of martial law in 1992, the people of Mazu were confronted with the question of how to move forward. This ethnography and social history of the islands focuses on how the individuals struggle to face their uncertain future by, forced, by forging social imaginaries. So this book is not about Mazu, but also about Taiwan and us in general. Let me show you where Mazu is located. This map shows that there are two groups of military islands between China and Taiwan. As you can see, one in the south called Jinmen and the, the northern groups are called Mazu Islands. Um, Jinmen is, is comparatively large, long settled and well-developed. Mazu is made of small scattered isolates with limited resources. Let's take a closer look at Mazu. The Mazu Islands comprise an archipelago along the northeast coast of Fujian province. Around this, this, this archip archipelago, is here. There are six islands from the north, uh, from the north to the south. They are called Xiying, Dongyin from the north, Beigan, Nangan, Xiju, and Dongju. From Mazu to Fuzhou city, it takes only one hour by ferry. From Mazu to Taiwan, it takes nine hours. Mazu is so Mazu is much closer to China. Taking night hours rough seas, the journey can sometimes seem longer than flying across the Pacific to American shores. My field sites, as you as you probably know, anthropologists do usually uh, do very long term field work. So my field sites are in Nangan Island. The major, the, 
biggest island of Mazu, in particularly Oxhorn and Shanlong. So Oxhorn is here and then Shanlong. So Oxhorn is the major field site. It's, uh, it's, it, it used to be the biggest uh, fishing village in Mazu. So I did field work. I, my field work uh, started from 2007 uh, till 2018. So in total 12 years. I first went to Mazu in 2006 to participate in a conference called Goddess Mazu was buried in the Mazu Islands. The islanders at that time were pondering whether they could use this myth somehow to create a niche for themselves between China and Taiwan after the army left in 1992. So you see the triangle in this map. So uh, this is the triangle they drew. So you see uh, Meizhou in China, right? Where the, uh, the goddess, uh, where the goddess Mazu was born. And then Dajia in Taiwan, which is the most popular uh, place. I mean, Mazu worship, also one of the biggest um, Mazu temple in Taiwan. And then the Mazu island, the, the Mazu island in the middle, so it's uh, you know it it this this is called golden triangle you know they they proposed it's a way by the Mazu Islanders I mean invented by them to locate Mazu Islands as a place between China and Taiwan so they can sort of uh, become the center you know they can connect they can become the center of this triangle. Then we see a statue here. Uh, it's giant Mazu statue. The myth is based on a stalag erected by a military commander in 1963. The inscription says that, okay, you can look at the inscription here. So this is the original stalag uh, the commander set up. And then Mazu people sort of uh, remade the, 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 the old statue into the new one. So in this new uh, stella, this inscription says that after Goddess Mazu jumped into the sea to save her father and died. Uh, I don't know whether you can see the, the, the words clearly. It says that, oh, he, uh, his father, you know, went fishing and then died, right? So she jumped into the wa uh, water to save her, to save her. But finally, you know, she sacrificed herself. And her corpse floated to the shore of Mazu. Her remains were buried there in Mazu. Going by how oceanic waves work, it's probably not a story, a true story, because how can uh, you know the corpse floated to so so much you know the northern place? So it's not really a, a true story. But the islanders seize upon it and set up a giant statue of the goddess. You know, on the right hand side of this uh, slide, you see the giant statue of uh, goddess. Uh, so it says that this statue faces uh, the faces Meizhou, uh, where she was born. You know, she was looking at uh, where the place that uh, where she was born. So they set up this statue to attract uh, more people, more visitors to see to to come to visit this island. Uh, for you know, of course, for a tourist purpose, to tourism purpose. So they are. There were also several other big projects, you know, carried out in Mazu. In many places, you can see houses have been rebuilt and preserved in this style. So you see here, the, this is the stone house all the stone houses here and the most colorful uh, building here is the temple so it's actually very beautiful when I first uh, came to visit this place I was so amazed to see wow there's a place like this in in ROC you know in in, in Taiwan um, so um, the attempt is, is to remake Mazu as an eastern Fu, Fujian cultural village it's a eastern cult, you know, eastern Fujian culture, which is different from 
Mingnan. You know, uh, uh, most uh, people in Taiwan originally came from southern part of Fujian. So this is eastern Fujian, you know, so sort of, sort of, you know, you see stone house and then, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, no extended uh, uh, housing housing group. So um, it's, it's actually very unique from Taiwan perspective, you know, Taiwanese people's perspective. And you also see temples, you know, which were rebuilt in this Eastern Fujian uh, style. So the characteristic style, you know, of this uh, temple is that you look at the roof, it's like a flame, you know, fire flame. So it's, it, it, it actually, it, it wants to, I mean, its original purpose is to stop flame. So it's called Ming Dong Shi, Feng Huo Shan Qiang. Phone, uh, stop a fire. So in Taiwan, you never see, you know, uh, uh, you know, temples like that. So the the miniature one here was the or is the original one. And then after, you know, in two uh, in twenty first in the twenty first century, they rebuild it. You know, they enlarge it into the new one. It's also the you know, it's just the time when I started to do field work. So I participated the whole process. I witnessed how they built this this big temple. Right. So uh, novel pilgrimage practices. The Mazu Islanders in the first century have launched many novel pilgrimages. On the right hand side of the map, you see from 2000, 2001 to 9, there were several pilgrimages trying to connect. Mazu is, it, is here. So you see so many pilgrimages which were meant to connect China and Taiwan. I mean, uh, if you are familiar with p a pilgrimage in Taiwan, they always go back to the same place, right? Their root temple. But pilgrimages in Taiwan never do in this way. They sometimes go to China, sometimes go to Taiwan, or sometimes just in between. They try to do this, you know, they keep on doing this to show they can connect China and Taiwan. They, they are the, you know, sort of center you know, of both places to show, you know, they aim to show that. And then on the left hand, left hand side of the map, there's one, you know, uh, which even going to Mount Everest in Nepal, the aim was to show that Mazu could become a connecting point between Taiwan, China and the world. So they are not really limited by this, uh, you know, China and Taiwan framework. They even try to make themselves, you know, known to the whole world. Asian Mediterranean. They even tried to draw in an American casino capitalist to build a large gambling resort, which they wanted to promote as Asian Mediterranean. So you see William Weiner, they, you know, they invite him to design a a, a, you know, a project to turn uh, Mazu into a gaming resort. However, they met significant opposition in this plan, you know, uh, from the young generation. The young generation do not want, you know, uh, gambling, uh, setting up gambling resort in their home place. So a referendum took place in 2014, if passed, but the Taiwan central government refused to allow it. So Mazu is the only place in Taiwan which passed the referendum of settling up gambling resort. In Jinmen and Penghu, it's all turned down. Jinmen people and Penghu people do not want gambling resort to be set up there. Mazu is an exception. So this is quite interesting. Why Mazu wanted want a gambling resort to be set up in their home place. So 
we can see that Mazu have continually pursued possibilities to relocate and redefine themselves in the 21st century. But the truth is, most of them were not fulfilled. You know, they passed the referendum, but then Taiwan central government refused it. They tried to they tried to say, oh, we are the uh, the, the Mazu goddess Mazu died here, but no one came to see them. So. Um, most of the projects they try to, you know, propose actually uh, did not really receive, uh, you know, um, the attention they they wanted. So I was curious about why did the motivation come from, you know, where did the motivation come from to pursue these projects? Why do they persist in their efforts despite meeting so many effort, uh, so many failures? How does the study of Mazu contribute to our understanding of Taiwan or even the world? So, um, so this this in today's talk, I will take chapter four from my book about gambling and a bit uh, from chapter nine and ten. Chapter nine about uh, 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 about the pilgrimages and 10 about uh, setting up a gambling resort to show you how I think about these questions. But I can, uh, here I can give you a brief uh, introduction of my book. This is the content of my book. So uh, part one, I discussed the history, you know, the history of uh, Mazu. But, um, but, but, you know, um, anthropologists are different from historians. We will not just talk about history. We will talk about, uh, you know, um, it's, a, it's social organization, it, uh, gender, you know, what men, what men did and women did during fishing, you know, early fishing village. And then I move on to when the army came. And then afterwards, I move on to uh, 19, after 1992, when the martial law was uh, lifted. So how people pursue their future. And then, uh, so part two, I talk, I talk about the, the new technologies of imagination. When internet come to this place, when new media came, how the six islands were sort of connected together before they, the, the army told them to, you know, the army tried to separate them so they can fight alone. You know, one island was, if one island was took over, the other islands can still fight against the, 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 the communist, the, the, the P, PRC. Um, so part three are Fantasia of the future. The, fu the, the future, the futures they try to e explore. But today, because of the time limit, so I only talk about, I choose uh, chapter, chapter four, nine, and 10, especially chapter four, as the major focus today. Okay, let me give you more about the background of Matu, uh, Matu Islands. <clears throat> Most islanders before 1949 were fishermen who were not permanent dwellers, but came and went, you know, came and went between the islands and the mainland. So these islands are actually, you know, they, they, they are no farming land in, in Mazu. It, it's different. It's very different from Jimen. In Mazu, you do not see any uh, farming land. It's very mountainous, very hilly. So uh, most people came here just, uh, you know, they, they hardly stay for a long time. They just came here um, to to do fishing and then when the the when when fish you know when they just went back to china so so you see it's not they are not permanent dwellers you know inhabitants but if they live there they uh, tried they would import things from china so um so 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 actually um they have to count on they have to rely on the goods in china so, so in general, China, uh, Mazu and China are together, and the and the mainland are together. They integrated as a whole, but the coming of Chiang Kai Shek's army in 1949 drastically changed the fate of these islands, which were used as military front line 
and cut them off from mainland China. So before they were very much rely, uh, connected to China and relied on China. But when the army came, they cut it off. So they become, in a way, lonely, you know, very sort of lonely islands <clears throat> because they were so much far away from Taiwan. And um, Chiang Kai-shek army, right, Chiang Kai-shek also named these islands officially as Lianzhang County to show he still ruled China. So today there are two Lianzhang counties coexisting, one in ROC, the other in PRC. Uh, which is quite interesting. You have two Lianjiang Xian in PRC and, and ROC. The KMT government also set up war zone administration. Um, you know, so the commander, so this place is actually uh, governed by the military rule after the Chiang kai shek army came. This, this war zone administration governed Mazu from 1956 to 96, uh, to 92, 36 years, supporting all civil affairs to the military command. The war zone administration, besides its military purpose, was also a modernizing project. As I say before, it was before it was just a you know sort of temporary place. There's hardly any uh, you know um, there's no schools, no hardly any roads. You know it's a, just a temporary place for people to to rest. But when the army came, it changed the whole place. The and then the change is basically a modernization process as you can see from this 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 uh, figure they set up schools and they set up some hygiene you know high high hygiene and then they try to improve uh, farming you know there so it's actually really a modernizing project to transform the islands into a well equipped self sufficient base ready for battle so so the people there can be ready for war or for battle so this is the the yeah okay this is the the one i i picked to show you the uh, modernization uh, institutes were set up uh, during that period They also published Mazu online, Mazu Rirbao, to unite the islands together. So they share the news, the same newspaper, different from Taiwan. The six islands share news, uh, read Mazu Rirbao every day. They also have their own currency. So they, the government launched the Mazu own currency to control the flows of goods. So you see here. They also set up, uh, they also constructed uh, many uh, new roads. Uh, uh, so on the, on the, I mean, at the road intersections, the army set up signs like one island, one life. Tongdao Yiming now is very popular in Taiwan because of COVID-19. But this concept, Tongdao Yiming, one island, one life, actually comes from uh, uh, Mazu. So Mazu has this concept for a long time. So this, this concept, in a way, was brought to Taiwan during COVID-19. People say that, oh, all the people in Taiwan share one life. But actually, this concept comes from uh, Mazu. In all ways, in all these ways, Mazu have Mazu has become an imagined community, which I use from Benedict Anderson, protecting China, Taiwan from China. At the same time, the freedom of the Mazu people was completely circumscribed. For example, 
95 military bases surrounded uh, Nangan Island. So you see, this is Nangan Island. There are 95 uh, bases surrounding this island. So you can see they are almost, you know, they are living, you know, in a prison like you know they 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 are circled by by this military bases so fishing economy their original you know fishing economy of course declined this uh, declined after Mazu was militarized, the movements of fishermen on the seas were deemed to threaten national security. So the state implemented a series of strict rules to reduce any potential threat and making fishing more and more difficult. For, so you can imagine, um, you know, the fishermen almost cannot live there. So a lot of them left Mazu to Taiwan to work in Taiwan, finally. So they said, there's no way to leave a Mazu. There's no hope. Um, in Fuzhou dialect, they say, mo lian wa, mo hi wong. Uh, I will use for Fuzhou dialect later because uh, it's the way people speak there. Hmm and it shows what they really think. From 1970 onwards uh, to 1990, the population of Mazu reduced by two thirds. Most of them moved to Taoyuan, Taiwan, where they work as laborers in factories. Taoyuan, it, Taoyuan County, or now Taoyuan City, is one of the biggest uh, industrial uh, place in Taiwan. So they went there to work as laborers. In this new migrant place, finally, they built an identical temple as the one in Mazu to help them settle down and to show how much they miss their homeland. As I showed you before, this is the original one, the very small one, and then they enlarge it. And then in Taiwan, they copy, sort of reproduce an identical one in Taoyuan. So the new one is situated in the city. In the, urban, in the urban area. Back in Mazu, the army gradually changed the islands. They established elementary schools and high schools. They designed a guarantee admission program, Bao Song Zhidu, for Mazu students to pursue higher education in colleges and universities in Taiwan. So when they finished their studies, they were required, they, they were obliged to return to serve as elementary teachers and work in or county, or county government for two years. So after that, most of them stay. Otherwise, uh, they, they would just work in, in Taiwan. So this, guarant this uh, guarantee admission program um, actually create new social categories. So you see new social categories started to appear in Mazu. So you see new local elites, for example, teachers and government employees appeared, superseding traditional family and lineage structures. And for those who graduated from elementary school, who are not really, you know, sort of, uh, you know, who were not able to study universities or higher education. They also began to have opportunities to find, job, to find jobs in government. Um, although most of them work at the lowest level of, of, the, of these uh, institutes. And for people who are illiterate, they could still sell vegetables, fish, and shellfish to soldiers. Many other businesses, such as small, small grocery stores, billiard rooms, laundry services, etc., also arose to serve the needs of soldiers. They were use, usually called abinga uh, shengyi or uh, GI Joe business, as uh, Professor Michael Zoni named it. He, he did research in, in Jinmen. 
So you see, this is a very precious picture <coughs> that I, you know, uh, it was filmed around 1985 because you know during the military period, people cannot, people could not uh, have camera. So a picture like this is very unique. You know, someone who was privileged, uh, you know, to go there and then, and, you know, taking photo. So from this photo, you can see women, it's mostly women who sell shellfish. You know, you see they put the shellfish, they collect it, uh, you know, in the sea to sell men and mostly soldiers. So the above is the social background for discussing gambling effect and resistance in the remain, remainder of the talk. The background is very important. Otherwise, you cannot understand uh, what I'm going to discuss uh, uh, now. OK, so today we come to the major issue, you know, major uh, issue of the talk today, gambling in the fishing society. Before 1949, the men in Mazu had a traditional, uh, has, has had a tradition of drinking and gambling whether after an exhausting day out at sea or while waiting for the tide. Gambling was a diverting way to pass the time and constituted the major male le leisure on the islands because it's men who went to who went fishing, right? So it's, it's also men who, who did uh, drinking and gambling. As men drank and gambled, they could naturally exchange fishing information and current uh, social news. A man who did not drink or gamble showed that he had neither money nor power. As the Mazu saying reveals, no whoring, no gambling. Ancestors are ashamed. This is very much, very different from Confucian, Confucian ideology. So I was very surprised to hear this when I, when I did field work. But this is what they think. Yeah, fishing and gambling are, in fact, mutually implicated as at an even deeper level. The senior boat captains I interview who have closely observed the fisherman's style all pointed to the fact that fishing is inherently a form of gambling. Fishermen were different from farmers who work the land. Out at sea, they must confront a host of unpredictable factors, such as ocean currents, wind direction, weather, and so on, all of which can change on a dime. Fishermen not only have to be highly adaptable, they must also be resolute and fearless in face of the danger in the sea. Gambling involves a high degree of luck and a winner takes all mentality that is closely complementary to the fishing experience. For this reason, gambling was more than just entertainment. It was also a training ground and a way of cultivating bravery and daring in fishermen. Anyone who was not brave enough to take substantial risks was unlikely to achieve a breakthrough this notion is reflected in the Mazu saying, better to give birth to a prodigal son than a fool. A prodigal son gives a family a chance of success, whereas a foolish son only eats up its assets. However, uncontrolled gambling can be ruinous to the family. So Mazu people also emphasize either whoring or gambling. You must take your own measure. Piu piu du du, jia tou zu, piao piao du du, zi ji heng liang, ni yao heng liang zi ji. It's crucial to know that these social linguistic expressions about gambling connote not only unique behaviors of fishing people living in volatile, volatile lives, but also imbued with a special emotional and affective intensity. 
gambling represented the adventurous or even audacious character of the islanders. It was not only the main entertainment or social activity for fishermen, the luck, skill, and the gambling spirit of risk that it entails also captures the the you know captures the the spirit that you you need when facing the perils of the capricious ocean. Okay, now we talk about the army's attitude of gambling. Perhaps owing to all worries about people gathering together and causing troubles, or concern about fostering addition, the military government detested gambling from the start of its rule. Nearly every year, Mazu Daily continually reported the arrest of gamblers. So, for example, Mazu Daily reported in 1972, 56 participants in a gambling ring are arrested, including two government officials, 26 businessmen, 15 fishermen, three visitors, and 10 women. So the police publicly burned gambling equipment almost every year. So the war zone, the, the war zone commanders, you know, the war zone administration commander would be at the scene to supervise to, and to express how serious the authorities views this issue. But the effect is not obvious. So the Mazu Daily again reported, although officials have put a, a, you know, a strict ban in place, addicted offenders still continued their own ways. So the effect is not obvious. And then the authority implemented increasingly harsh laws. They put in place strict importation and sales regulation. In 1982, it was even announced that anyone who worked for the government, including all office, office workers and service workers, would be fired immediately if it found to be engaging in gambling. So in Mazu Daily, it says that gambling is the first among all vicious. Vicious. Okay, now we look at how, you know, how gambling, you know, the, the, was going on in local society. In contravention to the government ban, gambling during military period extended to all walks of life. Before, it's only fishermen who, who, who did gambling, but now it extended to everyone. And its significance is multiplied. People told me the harder they try to, the harder the soldiers try to, Catch us, the more we gamble. 抓得越紧, Even government officials participated. So in Mazu newspaper, Mazu Daily, you see workers at uh, Mazu Distillery, Mazu Jiuchang, or a regulation of goods departments, Wu Zichu, or publishing office of Mazu Daily, you know, the, the place where they were all caught gambling and their names were all, you know, uh, announced in the newspaper. Gambling was also very popular in offices. One informant working for the Mazu Electric Co Company recounted the situation at that time. He said, back then, we never put away our mahjong table, well, our office mahjong table, when the lunch when the launch, launch, time, uh, launch break was up, everyone would rush to the table to get a spot. In order to get a spot, someone even skipped the lunch completely. Why were people so crazy about gambling? I asked him. I don't know. It felt like that was the only way we, can, we could get through the day. So here we can sense a nearly inexpressible passion and desire or effect vibrating among the office workers. It seems as if only by playing mahjong could one elevate the burden of civil service under military rule and make life bearable. Gambling during civil defense training, 民防训练, informants told me without any qualms 
an 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 official will be up on stage with speed flying as he talk about how to take care of our five arms and defend ourselves against the uh, communist uh, armies, communist spies. And we were just playing Chinese poker under the table. The low meandering turtles, I mean in Mazu, because it's very mountainous, so there are many turtles like this. So this meandering turtles on the islands were a haven for Mazu people to gamble, where they would not be seen by their uh, officers and can enjoy themselves during military training. Women were no exception. Women selling goods to the soldiers would also gamble, particularly those who opened shops to soldiers, GI Joe business. They often preferred to play dice since it produced a quick winner. And, um, you know, so um, they could uh, just, um, you know, they, uh, um, you know, um, because they, you know, they were housewife, right? So they, this kind of uh, dice, you know, dice playing can produce a quick winner and we will not take much of their time from their daily schedule. So when they finished their business, they just did it and then quickly, you know, they could quickly go home. They knew that if they were caught, they would be punished by having to sweep the streets, clean up gutters or even incarceration, but they still sought out their secret games. Many people told me their mothers, you know, um, their mothers, uh, you know, seven or 80 years old were very enjoy, uh, you know, doing these dices. So I sometimes, during my field work, I also play this uh, dicing with them. So after gambling for a short while, they would hurry back home or, you know, to cook, to care about the families. Gambling became a part of their daily schedule. Finally, I will talk about yellow croakers and Chinese dominoes, Huang Yu and Pai Zhou. While yellow croaker used to be very lucrative fish, which the fishermen could sell for a large amount of money, in the past, yellow croaker migrated in school. They usually came from the South, you know, uh, Southeast Asia, you know, uh, South Sea to Dongyin area from April to June each year. All fishermen would come to Dongyin during this season. So, okay, this map shows that here is Nangan and then Beigan, and he, this is Dongyin. So, Yellow croakers, wild yellow croakers usually came to this area. So fishermen will, would come to this, come to Dongyin and prepare to, you know, fish yellow croaker. During the breeding season, the air bladders of the fish let off sounds that attract members of the upper sex. Upper sex. In particularly crowded school, the noise can sound like boiling water, just like, you know, cattle, you know, boiling. When there were few fish detectors, of course, it's in the past, right? So very few fish detectors to locate the fish. Fishermen would often rely on the sound of the school to estimate the size. Just because the croaker made revealing noises did not mean that every fishing exp expedition was successful. Fishing was also a matter of luck. So for example, you look at this map on your left-hand side, there are three boats, boat A, B, and C. So boat B is very lucky because the captain uh, heard the sound, heard the noise, and he arrived just in the center, at the center. So he probably got most of the fish. And then boat A arrived at the margin, but still they can they could still get some. C, boat C, still hurt it, but just a little bit away. And boat C got none. So that's why Dongyin people say that when they catch, when they when when they 
caught a yellow crocus, the excitement was just like gambling. 抓到黄鱼跟赌博赌赢一样。They kept on saying this, so it's very much depend on luck. So, given all this. It's not surprising when the fishermen returned to shore, they held big gambling、uh, parties, either to test their luck again or to celebrate a good catch. The fishermen who caught croaker usually gambled in a heroic spirit. The the gamblers bid extravagant amounts in Chinese dominoes in fast-paced games. They do not. They did not play mahjong because it take it took too much time, so they chose the, you know, they chose paijiao, you know, dominoes,、uh, the combination of these、uh, four tiles, so they could do it quickly to win or you know to win. So a lot of money was quickly won and lost in each game, but they were indifferent to loss. The real purpose behind was to display and to compete to display. Their success, rather than consolidate their earnings. Chinese dominoes were was usually played in festivals in the、um, Mazu Islands. Even now, you still see them. You still see them playing it, but usually in Chinese New Year, playing dominoes during a croaker season does constitute a ritualistic activity. Precise because of this ceremonial na- nature, the military tended to look the other way and not shut the games down. By the time the season was over, most of fishermen had lost nearly all of their earnings. A man from Oxholm, where my you know my field site, the son of a fisherman, told me when. He, When he was young, his father spent two months every year in Dongyin, in a、uh, in the croaker season. Yet he always came back with empty pockets. I asked him why his father continued to participate if he didn't earning any money from it, and he told me, "That's just a part of being a fisherman. He couldn't not go." This is human nature. How can he not go for him? It's the way to show how a fisherman is. Owing to depletion, the white yellow croaker mostly disappeared after 1985. But still, elders still remember it. You know the way and everything. When I interview them, they could speak like what you know just happened. You know, j- just happened yesterday. It was hap- just just like you know they did it yesterday. Conclusion: Taiwan as islands. Taiwan is a country made of numerous islands, and as you can see from this map, it's very different from China or the continent. Or Taiwan is basically made of islands, many islands itself, and many islands surround you know、uh, around it, and. They are surrounded by the lived world of fishermen. However, there are very few anthropological studies, and also social studies. Sociologists also hardly study fishermen.、Um, so there are very few studies about the lives of、uh, Taiwanese fishermen. Most scholarly scholarly research, when carried out in non-urban places,、uh, Have focus on agricultural villages. This tendency can be ascribed to the profound influence that a renowned China anthropologist Morris Friedman's book *Lineage Organization in Southeastern China*, published in 1958, had on Taiwan studies. This is a very influential book, you know, influences both anthropology and history. Every anthropologist and historian, almost every anthropologist and 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 historian in Taiwan reads this book and influenced by this book. So this book examined how the development of lineage organization in southeast China 
was closely bound up with farming land. Having how much uh, farming land determines the size of lineage. And lineages usually compete with each other in every aspect. Under its influence, most of the early studies in Taiwan were carried out either in agricultural areas or uh, marketing towns surrounding by agricultural villages. Agricultural ideology also inevitably shapes how anthropologists interpret social phenomena. Gambling, which might lead to which might lead to selling of land and thus pose a challenge to the very foundation of agricultural society, is often planned for military uh, for family decline. Despite this, many studies have in fact shown that whether in China, Taiwan, or among the overseas uh, Chinese community communities, gambling is not seen as is not seen in a uniformly negative light. On the contrary, uh, gambling is inseparable from people's daily life. There's, uh, there's uh, a few literature among the Chinese gambling practices, um, but in a way, it, it's still a lot, you know, so I can't really go through all this. Um, But what I like to say is that different from previous literature, I argue that gambling during the war zone period became a new space of effect and resistance. Through the lens of effect, I show that gambling released the smothering inhibitions and oppressions of military rule and offered new possibilities for an imag imaginaries of resistance. Gambling was a stage for enacting humor, ridicule, and anger. Tom and drop it up. So they are mocking the, 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 the soldiers. And an imaginative practice weighted with political overtones with which to evade the iron control of the army during fishing period. So we can say, during the fishing period, islanders gamble, gamble with the ocean, but during the military period, they gamble with the state. Gambling after the war zone administration. After the war zone administration was uh, uh, abolished and the government stopped making arrests, the Mazu islanders were not as eager as before to gamble. I often hear them say, it wasn't exciting anymore. A lot of people just quit. However, the Mazu people's gambler spirit of taking risks did not diminish, but was kindled and kept alive during, uh, despite being steeped in war zone restrictions. Facing the uncertain relationship between Taiwan and China in the 21st century, a series of new imaginaries and actions was ignited. For example, as I show at the beginning of this talk, making Mazu into Eastern Fujian cultural village or reinventing Mazu as the bureau place of goddess Mazu. They, they still try to, you know, um, this, they still try to come, come up with new, new, imaginaries. On Mazu Daily or Mazu Online, it was very common to see government officers or people directly write, gambling on a future of Mazu. We should do this to do Mazu yiga wei lai, when they advocate uh, new projects for, for, for the islands. For, for example, when the Mazu County Commissioner Xian Zhang promoted setting up a casino resort to Mazu, hoping to transform the islands into Asia Medi an Asia Mediterranean, he wrote, "We should gamble on uh, an opportunity for Mazu. We should give Mazu a chance." Is what he wrote in Mazu Daily to you know to 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 ask people to support his idea. 
So finally, the proposal for the casino won because the islanders consider it provides Maju in crisis a chance. So netizen wrote, the casino gave another source of hope, or allowed it to allowed us to seize an opportunity, or even let its people to bet on the future. We can bet on the future, do you go way like this is what they wrote in their webs in in Mazu online. It's a you know, it's a local website that which people use a lot. So if we say that the Mazu people in the fishing period gamble with the ocean and in the military period, they gamble with the state. Now, in the 21st century, they support it to set up a casino to gamble with their future. The fisherman's mindset continues to be a way for the islanders to struggle with the uncertainty in the 21st century. Okay, the final slide, the significance of study Mazu. Ma Taiwan and Mazu are facing a very similar situation as islands squeezed by between major powers, for Mazu, it's China and Taiwan. For Taiwan, it's China and USA. So when, whenever regional geopolitical relations change, they must react quickly and reposition themselves to strengthen or even recreate their links to the world. So the endeavors, efforts, and risk-taking spirit of Mazu people rather than maintain the status quo are well are well worth our careful consideration Mazu's story is taiwan's story as well as a story found in every corner of the world thank you all for listening Thank you very much, Professor Lin, for a fascinating, a very informative um, research uh, presentation. And so uh, uh, really enjoyed listening to that. Uh, so now we'll transition to our Q&A period. So we welcome all of our online audience members to go ahead and leave questions and comments in uh, whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, uh, go ahead and leave your questions there and we'll be able to see them and I'll ask the questions of Professor Lin. While we wait for questions to come in, maybe I could ask the first question of, of Professor Lin. Um, I wanted to know more about uh, kind of the, you know, the, the theme of gambling is, is a very powerful one. I want to understand better the perhaps the economic conditions of those who are your interviewees in, in this ethnography. It seems like during the pre-war zone administration period, you know, you've made a very clear case that fishermen are involved in a very precarious profession. You know, it's it's extremely unpredictable whether you will have a successful harvest whenever you go out to the ocean. Then under the Warzone administration, the, the risk then becomes the encounter with the authoritarian state. And then today, um, I'm curious about where the precarity lies. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about Matsu today? Is it the case that, you know, have, have many of the, the Matsu who left, you said that two thirds of residents left during the Cold War period and went to Taoyuan to work as laborers. Have many of them returned to the islands? Is it still largely, um, you know, perhaps underpopulated? Uh, what are the economic opportunities aside from, you know, turning to gambling resorts? Is it mostly in tourism, or uh, what? What are the the possible industries? If you could tell us more. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, James, for raising this. Um, I can explain a bit more. Um, as I said, you know, fishing economy has already declined, right? Um, very few fishermen now in, in Mazu. So most people turn, during the military period, they turn into um, 
either you know uh, civil civil service workers or teachers or they sell the you know gi joe business the small business you know street vendors so uh, uh, to soldiers, but now soldiers left, left, uh, you know, uh, there's no uh, clear statistic, uh, you know, record of how many soldiers now still in, in, in Mazu, but according to some rumors, you know, because of course the, the defense, uh, the government will never ever tell you how many soldiers are still living there. But according to what I heard, uh, 2,000, around two to 3,000 or even less are in these islands. So you can imagine, I mean, they can't survive on just selling things to soldiers, right? So they have to think about new ways. That's why they are doing this. They have to, they have to come up with new ideas to attract visitors to attract um, tourists to visit Mazu. So that's why they want to, that's why they launch this kind of uh, uh, Mingdong Wen Hua Chun, East uh, Fujian uh, village, uh, uh, you know, uh, place. So to attract people from Taiwan to visit them. So tourism now is the major uh, uh, business there. So there's no factories. So in Mazui, actually the air is very fresh. You know, the, there's no factories. Their major income now comes from tourism, right? So, so that's why they have to keep on coming up new projects to attract people from Taiwan. That's why at the beginning they said, oh, we are, we are, we have Mingdong, we have uh, Eastern Fujian origin. So uh, attracting people from Taiwan to visit them there and then secondly they said oh we we were Mazu is the place where Gardens Mazu was buried so so many people so many people living in Taiwan worship Goddess Mazu right so they want them to fin to visit Mazu and then this failed it, it it didn't work so that's why at the end they drew in this American casino person because this person William Weiner he promised to give everyone sort of uh, a two, two, thousand, two thousand or more than two thousand, two to three thousand American dollars per month to everyone, right? Like Macau, right? So he said that, oh, I would set up uh, universities. I would build up many, many infrastructure, you know, for Mazu. I would, you know, sort of uh, do a very modern airport, right? To to increase the 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 uh, the convenience of uh, Mazu and and Taiwan, so so you see all this, they have to try to cat you know invent or create their future, and in a way, Mazu is very different from Jimen because Jimen still remains as a connecting point between Taiwan and Shaman. So even me, when I was when I'm visiting Shaman, I never take airplane directly from Taiwan to Shaman. I usually stop by Jinmen and then uh, Shaman because it only costs one third of the traveling experience uh, expenses. Where's Mazu? No one will stop by there, right? Because the it only the airport is very shabby. Fly propeller, you know, only propeller plans can land there because it's very mountainous jet plane cannot land there right so that's why Mazu is much more disadvantages than Jinmen that's why they have to keep on come coming up with this big plans to attract people and this is what I'm talking about you know they they try because China and Taiwan ignore them now you know it's no more a strategic military strategic place so people there have to come up with they have to imagine their own future yeah that's what i was uh, you know talking about these projects and usually these projects did not succeed but they, they just keep on thinking of uh, things and sometimes even very unreal i'm not very practical but they still think we should better our own future as as long as one succeeds, then we have the hope. Mm. Thank you, Professor Lin. Uh, 
we have a number of questions, so I will get to our audience questions. Uh, the first question is, you mentioned the younger generation did not like the casino being built. Has the casino seen good business or are citizens boycotting it? Mm -hmm. Sorry, young generation and then the question is what? The young generation did not like the casinos being built. Uh, have the casinos seen good business or are citizens boycotting it? Right, right. Okay. Um, the young generation, usually I mean the young generation was born after 1992 when the army left. So they... Uh, they did not, they never experienced uh, war or war zone period. So you see, they, um, they didn't, old, old generation always curse them by saying that, oh, you never suffer the hardship, right? So you did not know our problem, the problem of the island. Whereas the young generation, they never, when they never experienced the war period. So they are more or less like, children in Taiwan they you see the most obvious thing I, I saw I when I talk with these young people I found them they they speak with no accent at all they you know most uh, Mazu people spoke uh, speak with very strong Fuzhou accent you can me immediately tell them they are from Mazu whereas these young, young generation they came you know the you know, up they they were born after ninety ninety two, right? So they were like, they are like us, but they gradually feel that they, oh, okay, you see, they come to Taiwan to study because after ninety ninety two, the the traffic, the 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 freedom to move between Mazu and Taiwan is uh, increased. So they came to Ma, they came to Taiwan to study, and they they still they started to feel that oh. They want, they think Mazu is their home place. Where for the older generation, they still feel that Mazu is just a temporary place. Their home is in China, or they buy, they want to buy place, they want to buy houses in Taiwan. Mazu is only the stopping place, the temporary stop for them. Whereas for the young generation, they, they started to consider Mazu as their homeland. So they want Mazu to be a place they can live forever. They identify themselves as, as Mazu Islanders. Whereas the young, older generation, they think they either came from China or they, in the future, they would die in, 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 in Taiwan. You see what I mean? But young people, they, they told me they want to live here. They want to give birth. They want to, they have their families in, 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 um, in Mazu. That's why they have such different image or image of future from the old generation. So these young generation, they are also good at using media, you know, new media. So when they launch, you know, they really fought with the, the old generation in the referendum. So the referendum was a very important event because the young generation, firstly, re, it's the first time they realize they belong to Mazu and they want they fought with the old generation. And the focus of the, the referendum is is Mazu still a temporary rest uh, place or it's our home. Right? So the younger generation argue and then formulate a, a you know sort of a, an argument that Mazu is our home. Right. So this is, you know, the, 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 the major arguments in referendum. And then also this referendum make, makes the new generation, the identity arise. So you see now in, in Mazu, young generation becomes a very important force. Thank you, Professor Lin. Um, our next question there are actually a series of questions related to this one. So I'll, I'll ask this one first, but uh, I'll, I'll also ask a few other similar questions after this. Uh, author Amy Summers asks, Professor Lin, you noted that anthropological fieldwork in Taiwan has focused on agricultural workers over fishermen. What challenges, uh, what challenges have you encountered in this project? 
Right. Um, okay. I say at the be uh, at the end, you know, um, most uh, anthropological research um, do field work in villages, and they they are very Confucianist. You know, the ideology is basically very much Confucianist. Land, investing, you know, land is the very important, right? Whereas Mazu people, uh, Confucian ideology is also very conservative because to far to farm, you have to be very diligent. You have to invest the land. You have to go and work continually and diligently, right? Whereas Mazu people, they are different. They think once you get the chance, you will win. A winner takes all. So they they very much they do not really value. Um, you have to work consistently. They think you have to be flexible, adaptable. You have to recreate new connections, as you as you you are very adaptable and very flexible. You will have a chance. If you are only conservative, no future. I think it's quite obvious, isn't it? So they are never hesitant in betting on something, even it's unreal, even it's a bit dangerous. So this is very different from, oh, we should just preserve what we are, maintain the status quo, right? And I think nowadays, Taiwan is very in crisis, isn't it? So I think this also, this, when you study, when you study fishermen, you can learn something from them. You can see how they face the world. Taiwan is such a small place. If you are still very conservative, if you are not flexible, if you are not adaptable, you are not creating new things, you are not trying, you are not doing, taking, even taking some risks, where is your future? That's, that's what I think this case, you know, sort of, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I feel I really learned something, you know, because I was born in a, in a fishing, uh, sorry, in a farming place. That's what my, 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 parents or my grandparents always told me, oh, you have to be diligent. You shouldn't take too much risk. You should be conservative and accumulate your, your, you know. But I think Mazu people do not think in this way. They think you should be courageous. And of course, you have to value everything. You have to, you have to balance everything. But in gambling, they are learning these sort of uh, how to take in chance. Yeah, that's what I think this, uh, the, the, the value of studying Mazu. I think your answer leads us to um, a question from Professor Chuck Woldridge, which I think is a very good question that, that kind of responds to your answer. I do wonder about the framing of gambling as agrarian versus fishing. There's a lot of urban gambling in Taiwan. Mm -hmm, do you think mm -hmm. the understanding of gambling in, for example, Taipei, also reflects a kind of precariousness of city life and resistance to martial law and now to the urban government. Is that what you mean by Mazu being a story of Taiwan and the world, the sense of risk? Right. Mm. Mm. Maybe, um, uh, how should I say? I think I try to, you know, um, you see, I think because I think you know agricultural ideology or agricultural kind of thought uh, frames a lot of our our thought. So you see, um, um, we usually ignore the uh, how should I say? Of course, I agree with you know gambling is also a way to escape iron control of everything, right? I remember when I was a kid, I tried to gamble, 
uh, not to be seen by my parents, right? Uh, I pretended that I'm going to piano lesson, but actually on the way back, <laughs> I always did a lot of gambling and then, you know, spent all my money. And then after coming home, tried to steal money from my brother. So I was a thief and, you know, so I pretend to be a very good kid, you know, playing my, playing a piano in front of my parents. But on the way, you know, walking to the, to, to the piano lesson, especially on the way back, I always gamble on, on the way. Um, uh, right. So, so resistance, I think gambling is, it, it, it's always in a way related to, 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 to resistance, right? Um, <laughs> But I, I think I have a bigger ambition in saying so, you know, which is, I feel that, you know, Taiwan entrepreneurs, you know, um, Xiao Sheng Yi, small business, uh, or this, uh, Taiwan is famous for, for these uh, petty, petty entrepreneurs, right? They usually took a box and travel around the world, you know, try to sell things. So we see from them a sort of very adventurous spirit. They are not afraid of daring, you know, take daring to take risks. And I also think it creates the miracle of Taiwan, right? This, this spirit of trying to, you know, uh, trying to take chance and then, you know, being flexible and then being adaptable and then taking every chance. Um, and sometimes people say Taiwan is, uh, oh, how should I say? Anyway, so I, what I'm saying is that um, we usually to we usually think, oh, Taiwan is a very con not really conservative or very diligent be, uh, are a people of diligence. But I also feel that Taiwan are people of uh, daring to take risk. And this has never been discussed, right? I think this is the bigger aim or bigger ambition I, I wanted to say through this case, because I think we also have this, this part in, in us because Mazu, I use Mazu as a reflection or a microscope of Taiwan. Mm. Thank you for the, the very interesting uh, anecdote and also the, the, the excellent answer, I think that that's very, um, uh, I think it's a very profound way to understand gambling as representative of uh, a Taiwanese mindset. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I should also share that uh, I've, I've never gambled in my life. And whenever my <laughs> wife and I go to Las Vegas, we're always, we always find it maybe a little disappointing. And I think I realized much later on in life when I went with friends who actually gambled that uh, we're missing out on all of the fun. And so perhaps this is the reason why I am a poor academic and not uh, in a more <laughs> in a more prosperous <laughs> occupation. <laughs> okay, um, on to the next question. We have, we have many excellent questions, so I don't want to take up too much time. Um, let's see. There's a question from uh, Professor Xu Jing uh, about the, the anthropological literature. Uh, so she states that Charles, Charles Stafford wrote about fishing communities in Taiwan, including the risk-taking spirit. Uh, how does Matsu differ from the community that Stafford studied? Right, right. Um, okay, um, uh, Charles Stafford's work, you know, he did his, uh, he did his field site uh, in, in Green Island, Luida, right? Um, I wrote it, so, sorry, I read it long, long time ago. I think it was published in 1995 or even earlier, 30 years ago, right? So um, he actually was my supervisor for one year in Cambridge. Um, but I remember from my vague, very vague memory, I did not remember he was talking about the the adventurous or audacious uh, aspect of fishermen. I remember he was talking about military and then family. So as far as I can, con as far as I remember, he, uh, he did not really, you know, um, dig into this aspect. 
I may I may wrong I may be wrong. So I today you know I will look at the book again. You know the the but I as far as I remember, either his uh, his paper in JIAI, you know uh, 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 in in a very prestigious journal or his book. I did not really remember he really talk about it much. But I believe my difference from him is that I make gambling a theme throughout the whole book. I mean, either in fishing period or in, mil in a military period or nowadays in 21st century. So that's the major argument throughout the book. But I don't trust Stafford did that. I don't know how, I think this is my, 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 my uh, difference from him. Hmm. Yeah, thanks for letting us know, Xi Jing. I'll have to check out this book. I haven't read Stafford before. Um, okay, a, a couple of questions about gambling. Uh, one is from Professor Evan Dolly, who says, thanks for this fascinating presentation. Can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between gambling and the new religiosity? I'm also curious about the pilgrimage from Qilong to Mazu, the Mazu temple I know best in Qilong, linked back to Meizhou. So I was surprised to see the 2001 pilgrimage to Mazu. Right, right. Okay, thank you for this question. Um, uh, you know, I, I, my previous work uh, focused on religion. I'm actually a, you know, expert of religion. You know, my, I specialized in doing religion. So, two thousand what? Two thousand in two thousand eight, when I follow them to do pilgrimage. I was very excited. My mind is full of the pilgrimage I participated in Taiwan. But when I went with them, wow, this is a very different kind of very different kind of pilgrimage they did, right? So as I said in the beginning, you know, um, firstly I found it's not really a pilgrimage; it's really like a political uh, alliance. They they went to many places, and then you know they went to they started from Jilong, and then you see why did they start? It's a pilgrimage from Mazu to China, and why did they start from Jilong? It's of course it's a political; it has a political overtone because they wanted to show oh, Mazu can connect. Taiwan and China. So that's why they started from Jilong and then took passengers arrived in Mazu and then uh, and then go, and then went to China. So when they went to China, they did not directly go to the root temple, which is in Changle County. Instead of that, they took four days in circling huge i remember oh i was so busy in uh meeting uh political officers and then uh going to commercial uh, uh places you know sort of uh um, scenic spots and i even went with them to do massage and then to do to uh, uh to to some shores to they are checking or their house their houses the you know, in in Fuzhou City, so only final the find the final day they spent one hour in their root temple and then they came back. So that's why I felt, oh my God, this is totally different from what I know about sort of religious religious pilgrimage. This is political and commercial and then a tourist pilgrimage, right? Then afterwards, I participated in their in many of their pilgrimage which i discussed in chapter eight so finally that's how i came up with the argument the pilgrimage actually is to re-centralize themselves as the center connecting china and taiwan so they always go to different places this time they go to ningde next time they went to Changzhou. then you know every time they do different places then i ask them I asked the organizer, I said, oh, well, why, why are you doing this? Is, is, is this religious or what are you doing? Then he said, oh, you are sort of, uh, you know, why do you, why are you so uh, stubborn? You know, this could be everything. This sort of uh, pilgrimage could be everything. We took it, we learned it from Taiwan, but we make into Mazu, Mazu style. 
So we do this kind of model pilgrimage, and this is what we invented. We want to put everything together. So at the end, I was confusing. Wow, my goodness, this is not religious pilgrimage at all. It's to recentralize themselves, as you know, to that we, you know, before they think, oh, we protect Taiwan from China. So we are in a way, a, a, you know, Taiwan can not be uh, with us. Otherwise, Taiwan will be a uh, sort of sort of uh, you know uh, offended by China. But now they try to say, oh, we are still very important to Taiwan and China. So religion becomes very minimum in this. Yeah, so that's why I think this is uh, what uh, religion is sort of reused in these pilgrimages. And it, it's no more the, the major concern in, in, in these uh, activities. Thank you, Professor Lin. Um, there's another question that's related to religion. So I'm gonna ask this one. Uh, could you explain more about how the belief of Mazu is passed down to children in homes? Right. Okay, um, let me, let me, uh, 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 tells you, uh, this is, uh, I think it's also very interesting. Um, Mazu, Goddess Mazu is at, at the beginning was not very important in, in, in uh, the Mazu Islands because people in the Mazu Islands came from eastern part of Fujian. So another god, another goddess called Chen Jinggu or Lin Shui Fu Ren. She's very important. And also other Ming, uh, Eastern Fujian uh, religious gods, for example, Wu Lin Gong, are still all very widely respected, you know, worship in Mazu. So in Mazu, you see people came from several places in Eastern Fujian. So every village has their own deities, their own uh, deities. But Goddess Mazu, in a way, is 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 why it became more and more important because of soldiers, because of commanders. These soldiers came from Taiwan, so they came to Taiwan when they came to Mazu to do military service. They do not know who Wu Ling Gong is. You see what I mean? So, so the commander every year will go to Mazu Temple to worship there in a way to calm down, you know, to calm, not really to calm down, you know, it's the religious ceremony. And then he goes to, he never went to other temples. He only went to Mazu temple in, in, in uh, Goddess Mazu temple because it's the temple where, uh, uh, where soldiers know. Whereas in most uh, Mazu people's houses, Lin Shui Fu Ren or Chen Jinggu is more important. So the development of Goddess Mazu belief in a way is very related to the military period. But this is not totally correct if I only say so. Because if you see the historical chapter, chapter one in my book, then you will see Mazu, you know, these small islands were where the pirates heat. You see, uh, you know, during Ming and Qing dynasty, they are along the coastal area, there were many pirates, you know, uh, um, in this area. So these pirates also built this Mazu temple and gradually they became important. Okay, so the most important Mazu temple is right at the front of the port where Mazu people took military ferry to Taiwan. You see what I mean? So in a way, it's a bit complicated. In a way, the importance of Goddess Mazu was sort of, uh, 
you know, promoted by the commander, by the Taiwanese or Chinese commander. That's why, that's why Goddess Mazu was very in the Mazu Island. It's totally a myth. It's not true. It, you, if you go to, I think in the future, if you have a chance to go to see the temple, it's actually, there's a tomb there. Uh, people are really doubtful. Was it? Was, was it? Was it really? Was Goddess Mazu really buried there? If you ask Mazu people, they are very suspicious. They 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 are very suspicious. They think that it's not really Mazu, you know, Goddess Mazu. So, in a word, okay. In sum, I have to say. Mazu is a place, you know, dwelled by people from different origins, from different places in China. They came and then they just they just shortly stopped, you know, stop there. And they always want to, before they always wanted to go back to, to China. So even so, when even when they settled up, Goddess Mazu was not really so important. And it's during the historical process, it gradually enforced by the military commander, enforced by their connection with Taiwan. That's why Goddess Mazu becomes important. If you see every house, Lin Shui Furen is more important. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting because I also would have assumed that initially, um, at least in the early wartime war zone administration, it, the officers should have been Wai Shenlin. And the Weishenlin religious mm -hmm. practices would likely not have been um, Matsu worship because most of them probably did not originate in the coastal areas um, of southern Fujian. So uh, very interesting to hear how that developed over time and how it became. Uh, yes. But, but, but you see, may, may I? Uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, you see the, the, the very blurring stellas uh, uh, set up, you know, erected in 1968, I showed it before, mm -hmm. you know, you see the commander, the way he wrote the stella, very interesting. He said that, oh, because, you know, Mazu, uh, a goddess Mazu jumped into the sea and saved her father, right? So he said, oh, this is a very good example. You know, she sacrificed herself to save the family, right? So he used this myth to encourage people there, to encourage Mazu people and encourage soldiers there to sacrifice themselves to protect the nation. So he intentionally put, select this myth to encourage people, saying that your sacrifice will not be a waste. So he said it clearly. He said that, oh, the, the myth is very you know, important and insightful for us here. We we sacrifice us in this barren islands to protect Taiwan against China. So that Stella, that Stella wrote it clearly. So he intentionally used that to encourage a uh, 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 Mazu people and soldiers. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we're at time, but I don't know, Professor Ling, if you have something to go to. There's one more question. I don't know if you'd be willing to answer the yeah, final sure, question. Sure. Okay. Um, this is about, uh, I guess, contemporary kind of tourism. Uh, do people in Matsu today face any hostility from Chinese or Taiwanese tourists due to their location? Hostility? The question hostility. is hostility, but I, maybe you could just talk more generally about the attitude of Taiwanese or Chinese tourists in uh, when they visit Matsu. Right. Okay. Um, you know, um, when I told people I study Matsu, they usually told me, "Oh, where is it?" Oh, maybe they know where it is, but they hardly visited that place. So it remains a very vague place. As I said. At the beginning, you know, um, uh, uh, if you if you are going to Mazu, either take airplane, propeller, airplane, right, or by ferry, and propeller airplane usually, oh, you know, as, as 
you know, it's it's a very it's usually in a difficult situation. You know, it, it's very foggy, so uh, the you know the flights got cancelled. So, for example, if I'm going to Mazu, I usually book three flights, right, or con consecutive three days, right, because the propeller sometimes cannot land because of fog, because of cloud, or you know, it's it's not jet plane that you can land uh, successfully easily. So sometimes I have to take ferry, and then ferry, oh my goodness, nine hours. So I always feel that oh, it's very difficult to reach there. For example, I'm going to give a talk in April because my Chinese, the Chinese version of this book is is going to publish very soon. So I have to give a you know two book talks in Mazu. So I actually book two uh, two tickets, you know, two days, right? So Mazu in a way remains as a very far away, very remote place. It never comes into um, Taiwanese uh, hardly. It, it remains as a very remote and vague. It's a vague picture. So, so, so my ethnography is a way. You know, the first ethnography of Mazu. So, um, I met some people who uh, who who went to Mazu. They are either oh very happy very uh, pleased to, to you know to talk about Mazu saying wow it's so different from Taiwan but the other complain oh it's very difficult to reach there right um but recently after I finished my uh, field you know field work I finished my field I completed my field in-depth field work in 2018 but then after that there's a very big art exhibition art festival uh, sponsored by Zhong Tongfu, the President Hall there. And surprisingly, it becomes such a big event. So Mazu now becomes a sort of hot place for young generation because the art exhibition, right? It, it was so successful. And then the President Hall, you know, President, uh, the President put so much money in that art exhibition. So now it sort of you know, becomes a place where people wanted to go. So these years, especially these three uh, three years, when I told people that I I, I study Mazu, and they sometimes show me a kind of uh, envious look. They feel, oh, we wanted to go there. Oh, it's a, such a, a, a this you know far away place, right? But for Mazu people, it's different. Mazu people's. Uh, 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 how they see Taiwan is a different story because uh, you know they are minority and uh, they support D uh, uh, KMT, right? I think that's another story. They strongly support KMT. Ninety-five percent of people there supported KM KMT. That's very unique. Still there. So um, uh, in the future, anyway, uh, that's another story of the book. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. We've we've gone through all the questions, and uh, it's thank just you. been such a enlightening talk as well as an enlightening thank question you. and answer. Um, so thank you very much for joining us, uh, and uh, yeah, we will wish everyone a, a good evening. And uh, please read Professor Lin's book; it is available for free, open access. My final mm -hmm. reminder. Thank you, James, and thank you everyone for coming and your excellent questions. Um, I I think this uh, your questions help me a lot to 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 think about my data and some references of course you know I will go through it and to to see um, if I can improve more in the future I'm still I'm still although I finished this book already but I'm still writing short papers not you know papers or articles and I'm studying infrastructure there you know um, so my work of Mazu hasn't really stopped yet still going on so thank you very much for your great uh, questions I benefit a lot okay thank you professor Lin good night everybody good night bye then